a big distinction between what we're doing and what other people are trying is this whole mobile concept and the time to market and it's a much lower capital cost to go with you know this modular approach than it is for a conventional plant. My next guest is Dr. John Burba, CEO of International Battery Metals Limited, trading on the CSE under the symbol IBAT and in the United States under the symbol IBATF. Dr. Burba, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be with you. Yes, I'm excited to have you. In particular, because of the outstanding performance of your company's share price in the last, call it eight weeks, you've gone from to two, three dollars a share to now over six dollars a share. What has been the impetus driving that besides the obvious, the lithium price? Well, lithium price is a big thing, of course, but I think that for us, we have completed the build on our um, mobile lithium extraction plant. We've assembled it and we're entering into the factory acceptance test and shortly, probably in May, we will be literally extracting lithium from brines that we're going to be getting from a number of resources. All of this is taking place at a uh, fab shop facility in, in Louisiana. And we'll be using uh, real brines from the United States, Argentina, Chile. And um, so we'll be demonstrating that this system, you know, how the system performs with those various brines. Once we're completed with that, we will uh, drain the system and then we will take it apart and uh, put it on a ship and send it to South America. And, uh, so this, uh, this equipment is already spoken for and it will uh, end up at a Solar either in Chile or Argentina. I see. So is the facility then in Louisiana a, a pilot plant? No, this is a commercial scale plant. Okay, so what rate of throughput does it have of brine solution? Yeah, about 400,000 gallons per day of brine. That's going to produce over 20,000 tons per year, I would think. It won't be quite that much. If, we're, you know, if we were sitting on a brine such as the uh, brine at Solar Atacama, where lithium concentration is 2,000 parts per million, we could probably be approaching 10,000 tons. If we're on a solar like uh, Solar Ombre Merito, where the lithium concentrations nominally about 600 parts per million, you know, we're probably more in the range of 5,000 tons per year. So, the, um, in all of these systems, because you're hydraulically bound, you can only pump so much brine and water through. Um, lithium concentration is the biggest determinant in terms of, of productivity on a particular piece of equipment. Then the next thing is what fraction of that lithium do you actually recover as a, a useful product? Our last guest was uh, Jonathan Evans, who's the CEO of Lithium Americas, and he was saying that the direct lithium extraction technologies are all bespoke to the brine based on its chemistry. So have you developed a process that is less specific to a particular brine chemistry that can handle a wider range? Yes. Okay, and so you're using an exorbitant, uh, exorbitant technology that I imagine where the brine solution is passing across through uh, exorbitant beads that then selectively extract lithium and isolate it from the impurities? Correct. And our particular absorbent has a stunningly high selectivity factor. Okay, can you talk a bit about the science behind the selectivity? How does that process work? With most of these direct lithium extraction technologies, he's correct. You're very, they're very sensitive to the brine because the brines are very complicated and they're different. So the brine in Chile will be somewhat different from the brine in Argentina. In fact, the, uh, the brine in the Atacama, it changes from location to location on Solar Atacama. And that has to do with the diagenesis of the formation of that particular SLAR. Um, but the brines in North America are different, and even across the United States, they're different. So we can see brines, uh, some of the brines that we'll be testing from the United States uh, will have very high calcium levels, high sulfate, lower magnesium, and um, they'll have lithium concentrations in the range of probably four or 500 parts per million. Um, 
The, uh, the Chilean brine is very high in sodium and potassium, lower in calcium and magnesium, but they have a lot of borate and sulfate in them. Um, the Slar, you know, the, the brine in um, Ombre Merito at FMC or Leibniz plant is very similar to the Slar in the Atama, except that the lithium concentration is not as high. So you have variants in all of these. So the absorbent that we're using is one that a, a partner of mine and I invented back in 1992. And uh, this particular material has an extreme selectivity for lithium, and that's about the only metal it can pick up. So it ignores, it ignores the other metals. And then it, it has a double selectivity. We can set the selectivity for an ion that we want to pick up, an anion, and so it's selected for chloride. So this thing picks up lithium chloride and ignores essentially everything else in the brine. Therefore, this particular technology is not as sensitive to brine composition as, say, ion exchange systems and other kinds of uh, technologies people would be looking at. I've been studying direct lithium extraction technologies, and apart from the membrane extractions and the ion transfer, the absorbent bead process uh, has, you know, it's largely... Its economics are largely determined by how many cycles you can use them for before you have to replace them because as sort of highly specialized engineered absorbent beads, they have a limited life and then you have to either recycle them or replace them. So in your process, how many times can you use the same sort of batch of beads before you have to replace them and how does that affect the economics? Well, to begin with, our process, the uh, material that we're using is not very expensive. And it's a very simple process to make the absorbent. Okay, and so the, um, if the system is uh, treated correctly, we, are, you know, we anticipate probably about a two-year life on the absorbent. And um, you don't have to dump everything and put in new material. You know, what happens with this is that there is some mechanical degradation, <clears throat> degradation, <clears throat> excuse me, of the absorbent. And so we just uh, remove that fine material from the column and then backfill with uh, enough material. To pop it off. Uh, it's similar life to what one would see with the uh, typical ion exchange resin. Uh, so, you know, some of the materials that people are working with tend to be quite friable. And so that may be part of their problem. What? is the sort of target cost of production per ton of finished lithium product. Where is that sweet spot from your perspective in IBAT? Until we actually are you know, operating on a, uh, consistently on a, a real brine, you know, I, 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 I'd say until we're in commercial operation, I'm going to be hesitant to put a number on it. There's a lot of uh, interest from obviously Chinese battery manufacturers to secure future supply of lithium for their battery plants, especially now that CATL, the world's largest battery manufacturer, has announced plans to find a North American location and build, I think it's uh, 60 to 80 gigawatt hours of production. And then we've got uh, LG Electronics from Korea partnering with Stilletson, uh, the owner of Jeep and among other brands to build a plant in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Um, have you had any discussions with any major Chinese battery manufacturers at this point? No, we have not. We have not. But, I mean, it makes, you know, what people are doing makes sense. So uh, part of our business plan is to, um, is to produce lithium from the United States. We have, a, we have a partnership with a company called Insortia that extends to Chile and Argentina. And then we want to be very heavily involved in North America. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a key target for us. You mentioned on your website about the, the, a greener process for processing lithium. And obviously we've seen in the news, uh, you know, expressions of concern from the environmental groups regarding the effect on habitat in Chile of salt pond evaporation, solar evaporation, as well as concerns about the volumes of water required to continue with especially additional 
processes involving salt pond evaporation from more salars. There's, a, there's some concern that there's a limit to how much production can be allowed using that process because of the heavy water usage and environmental risks. So your process, I'm assuming, uses much less water overall than the salt bond, pond evaporation process? We don't use acid and base. It's not required for this process. I mean, if we end up in a brine that is highly alkaline, you know, we may add a little bit of hydrochloric acid to bring the pH down where it would be optimal. But it is acid and base is not used in our um, in our absorption cycle. So basically, brine goes through our extractors. We pick up lithium and chloride ions selectively, and then we extract those you know the lithium chloride with water, and then we get a um, a very pure lithium chloride solution that comes out, and um, then we need to concentrate that up. And so we've developed a um, really cool technology for concentrating the um, lithium chloride solution from about uh, 1% or 2% lithium chloride up to 12% lithium chloride without any evaporation. So then uh, the process water that we recover from that is recycled back into the plant. So we're, we will operate, we're projecting about a 98% uh, water recycle in our operation. Due to the environmental issues, particularly in these really sensitive areas, uh, we are going to have a, we're going to put, build a lithium carbonate slash hydroxide plant on the coast of Chile. And therefore, what we will do is concentrate lithium chloride up to approximately 30% by weight. And then we would ship that down the trucks to the, to the plant location on the coast where we'll make the hydroxide and carbonate. And then we'll backhaul water from a desal unit back up to the plant. So that's where we'll get all of our water. So this whole process is designed to use minimal chemicals and to uh, conserve water to the max. Is your business model then to provide the service of extraction and concentration of lithium products on behalf of the owners and operators of Solar and brine based operations, or is your business more to participate in the ownership of those brines and Solars with the operators and share in the revenue? In Chile and Argentina, we have a license arrangement with a company called Insortia. And there, uh, we have a royalty. We receive a royalty on the uh, sale of final products. We uh, build on a cost plus basis, and then we operate on a cost plus basis, and we own 10% of the project. Okay, so that's for Chile and, and uh, Argentina. We don't have anything set in the rest of the world. So our goal outside of Chile and Argentina is to become a lithium producer. So we want to own our own resources. You know, I'll do joint ventures with people, and you know, we can we can look at any kind of business construct, and it may or may may it may or may not make sense. But <clears throat> the main thing is that we want to be a producer. So we will take we'll go from from the brine to high purity final products to you know the battery manufacturers or whomever wants those things, and um, you know that's the direction that we we want to go. The Clayton Valley is sort of the the only place where there's uh, considered to be high quality lithium brines, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and elsewhere, and by through extensions of that geology, it's more tied up in uh, in clays. And so, does your process deal with the clays as well as more liquefied brines, or is it is it specifically just for liquefied brines? No, we're really interested in, in the brine chemistry. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, uh, I did some lithium extraction from clays. And uh, that's a lot of work. It's a pretty nasty process. Consumes a lot of chemicals and makes a huge mess. Uh, that's more difficult than, extract, than extracting lithium from spodumene. Hmm. Right. So right now, 52% of the world's lithium is coming from spodumene hard rock sources using more or less traditional mining methods. Um, <clears throat> do you see that that ratio of hard rock sources to lithium brine sources switching out 
over time and lithium brines taking the lion's share of global supply? So we, we built a plant that's nominally 5,000 metric tons per year to produce lithium chloride. And um, now recognize that that depends on the lithium concentration in the brine because all these things are hydraulically bound. You only pump so much water through. Um, but this is nominally a 5,000 ton plant. Right. And we're going to be firing it up in a few weeks. And we'll start processing. First of all, we'll do water and all that kind of stuff. Then we'll put the absorbent in the, um, in, um, into the system and we'll start extracting lithium from brine. And uh, we expect to be doing quite a lot of that in um, May in particular. And we have people who have signed up to, to deliver real brine to us from various locations. So there's potentially two locations in the United States that will ship tankers to us with brine. And then there's the possibility of brine from Argentina and brine from Chile. And so hopefully we'll end up with, um, you know, four of these brines. And all of these have different character. And that's one of the reasons I want to run them all. Are there any competitors out there that you see sort of nipping at your heels in terms of direct lithium extraction? There's a lot of companies out there making claims, but there aren't too many who have actually done it. There's, there's, you know, there's maybe three instances of actually commercial production of lithium through DLE processes. So you don't see anybody, you don't see the competitive landscape getting crowded with this type of approach anytime soon? The big distinction between what we're doing and what other people are trying is this whole mobile concept and the time to market. And it's a much lower capital cost to go with you know, this modular approach than it is for a conventional plant. And if you go back to the situation with demand and the shortages, we will be able to address that much more easily than anybody else will. But the key thing on this thing is this modular. There are a lot of small solars. And if you look at the, if you were to go out and look at all the lithium that's in the small solars, it may be equivalent to the lithium that's in the big solars. But you can't afford to build a plant on them because they may only last five or six or eight years. We can put our modular system in there. We can run it at, at whatever rate we choose. And then when we have reached the end of the life of that solar, we pick the equipment up and leave. And from an environmental standpoint, it looks like it did before we got there. And then we move our equipment to another solar, set it up, and keep going. So, you know, that's another key advantage. So we can, we can reach more solars than the conventional built processes, and processes can reach. John, we're going to have to leave it there for now. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it very much. You bet. Bye for now. Bye for now.